Good morning, everybody. I hope all is well. Uh, today's topic is the Perkins 2500 series engine. In the last uh, session, we talked about the 2200 series engine. Size and uh, 400 kVA size. This engine, today's topic, the 2500 series, uh, as Jubaili, you know, we are covering the range from 450 to 500 kVA size using this engine. This is not a Perkins engine, really. It is a CAT engine. It is made in USA. It is not a Perkins engine. It's a good engine. And we will go through details for this engine. There are a lot of common things if comparing this engine to the 2200 series engine you know, from the previous uh, lecture. So let's go through this one. Okay. So these engines are called MIWI engines. That's what we call them. What do we mean by MIWI? Mechanically actuated, electronically controlled unit injection or injector. Uh, First, what is the difference between an electronic engine and a standard mechanical engine? On standard mechanical engines, we have fuel injection pumps. On electronic engines, we do not have a fuel injection pump. On the mechanical engines, a fuel injection pump has, in general, two main jobs to do. The first the job is to highly compress the fuel inside the fuel injection pump, of course, and send it through pipes to injectors, because injectors would not spray fuel unless fuel is pressurized to a certain pressure. Example, for example, on the uh, small mechanical engines, we have the 1100 series engines, injectors need uh, 250 bars to spray fuel, okay? So the compression of the fuel, on these mechanical engines would be done by the fuel injection pump. The second job, the timing, which means the fuel injection pump should send this highly compressed fuel to the injectors one at a time on the third stroke for any piston and according to the firing order. This means that, for example, uh, a four cylinder engine, the firing order is one, three, four, two, which means the fuel injection pump would be uh, sending highly pressurized fuel to injector number one whenever its, its piston is in the uh, third stroke, the compression stroke, the combustion stroke, sorry. Next, it would be number three. Next, it's going to be number four. And afterwards, it will be number two. And it's a cycle. This will be repeated all the time as long as the engine is running. Going back to our engine, the MIWI engine, since that we do not have a fuel injection pump on these engines, um, we are using a mechanical force to highly compress the fuel inside the injector. This is the alternative, you know, compressing the fuel. The fuel is compressed inside the injector. We will go into more details when we go further with this lecture. Second, electronically controlled. This has to do with the timing that we have already, you know, uh, uh, talked about, which is should be done by the fuel injection pump, which we don't have on these engines. This means that the timing issue, knowing when each injector should be spraying fuel at the proper timing, this is controlled by the ECM. That's what we call it, why we say electronic control. It is controlled by the ECM. ECM, of course, is the microprocessor that we have on all electronic engines. We call them ECMs or ECUs. ECM or ECU stand for Electronic Control Module or Unit. And here, unit injection. It uh, doesn't make that big deal. Okay, let's proceed with this. Here we go. These are the two engine sizes that Jubaili used to cover the 450 and the 500 kVA genset size. The first engine model is 2506A, six means six cylinders A. This has to do with the exhaust emission levels. We have A, C, D, and E. A is the lowest. So what we receive are the A version. 
E stands for electronic engine. 15, this is the engine capacity, 15 liters. That's what it means. T stands for turbocharger. It means that this engine is turbocharged. We might have one or more turbochargers on these engines. On this specific engine, the 2500 series, we have only one uh, uh, turbocharger. A stands for air cooler, the after core or the air cooler. The, uh, let's call it radiator. This is the radiator used to cool down the highly compressed air, which is compressed by the turbocharger. Uh, these are the two sizes, the TAG1 and the TAG2, the 2506 engine. Um, we need to mention something else as well. Are these engines switchable from 50 to 60 hertz? Yes. All what you need to do is make a link between, between two wires, 318 and 322. Whenever we make a link between these two wires, the speed of the engine will go to 60 hertz. What's the physical difference between the uh, TAG1 engine and the TAG2 engine? It is only the software on the ECM. Sometimes, you know, uh, we find that we have a lot of 450, you know, KVA engines, the TAG1 in our stock, but what we need is TAG2. We have a shortage on TAG2. So we can, you know, convert this engine, the TAG1, to TAG2 and vice versa as well. All what we need to do is uh, you know, adjust the software on the ECM. Of course, this has to be done uh, through Perkins, of course, okay? And they will send us new sticker names for the engine that will be converted. Okay, let's proceed now. Here we go. Uh, the head cover is made from plastic. The oil sump is made from plastic as well. They call it composite material. Why? Cheaper, lighter in weight, and uh, it isolates the noise level. It cuts down on the noise level. Uh, this engine would take 60 liters of oil. That's how much it takes. It's a big sum. According to Perkins, we should you know, replace oil every 500 running hours. In our countries, we are not doing this. We are going with half this much, like 200, every 250 running hours, we change oil and filters, fuel filters and oil filter. Why? Because of the fuel issues that we have, you know, in our countries, the fuel we use, the diesel fuel has high sulfur contents. That's why uh, we replace the oil every 250 hours. The type of oil to be used, the type, either CH4, and it's preferred to use the upper grade, the CI4 type. The viscosity, the standard of Perkins, 15W40. This means, what does it mean? 15W, W means winter. In winter time, we need low viscous oil. So this oil, will work on 15, low viscosity. In winter time, we need high viscosity oil. So uh, in summertime, sorry, we need high viscous oil. So this oil will go to 40. The, the uh, oil will be more viscous. We call this uh, type of oil multi-grade oil. Okay, let's see if we have some. Okay, concerning the antifreeze that we use, you know, on our cooling systems, this applies to all the Perkins engines we have. It is better to use the extended life coolant type, or the, some people call it long life coolant. That's what's uh, recommended by Perkins. We cannot just use any ethylene glycol, you know, type of antifreeze. It is, uh, you know, better to use the extended life coolant, the ELC type or long life coolant, whatever you want to call it. It should be available in the local markets. Okay, uh, this engine has its camshaft mounted inside the head, not on the engine block, like other, you know, uh, the classical diesel engines. 
So there are no push rods between the lobes of the camshaft and the tip of the rocker arms because it's mounted in the head. That's for the camshaft. The injector sleeves, in general, any diesel engine, you know, the sleeves, the injector sleeves are made from copper, brass. For this specific engine, the injector sleeve is made from stainless steel. And it has two seals here at the top and one at the bottom part in here to prevent, you know, coolant leakage. You know, here we have coolant to cool down this part of the injector where the injector will go inside the sleeve. So these seals are here to prevent antifreeze or coolant leakages, you know, upwards or downwards. That's how the piston looks like, one piece. Okay, this is uh, the gear chain for the 2500 series. This is the gear of the camshaft. Remember, we mentioned that the camshaft is mounted inside the head itself. Uh, this is the crankshaft gear. These are idler gears. Here we have the gear for the water pump. Here we have the gear for the fuel lift pump. It is gear driven type. And uh, this is for the camshaft, of course. If you look at the camshaft gear, you see these uh, balance weights, rotating balance weights. Why do we have these uh, rotating balance weights? Because whenever the camshaft is rotating, it will cause vibrations. So to absorb the vibrations, this is the job of the rotating balance weights. They will absorb the vibrations created by the, the rotation movement of the camshaft. Talking about the fuel system, this is the fuel system. This is the fuel lift pump. These are the two fuel filters, the primary one, the secondary one. These are the injectors that are mounted on the head. And that's how the system works. The starting point would be from here. Fuel will be going in, get filtered through the, fuel, the primary fuel filter, go out, go to the fuel lift pump, go out, go through the fuel filter's head, get filtered again through the secondary fuel filter, go out through this hose all the way to this end of the head. It will go inside a gallery inside the head itself, supplying fuel and cooling the injector parts, you know, where the sleeves are at the same time, and then get out through this hose all the way back to the fuel filter's head. In here, below, in here, below you know at the bottom part of the uh, fuel filter set in between the two fuel canisters we have a fuel check valve why do we need a fuel check valve for two reasons to uh, regulate the fuel pressure the fuel lift pump fuel pressure which should be around 60 to 65 psi this applies to all engines in general whenever the pressure exceeds 65 psi this fuel check valve which is mounted right here below will open up a bleeding fuel bag through here, all the way back to the fuel tank. Before the fuel is, you know, uh, drained back to the fuel tank, it will, the fuel will go through a fuel cooler to cool down the fuel before it goes back to the fuel tank. Why? Because we are not supposed to have fuel temperatures exceeding 55 degrees Celsius. What happens if, you know, the fuel temperature exceeds 55 degrees Celsius? the fuel burning efficiency will go down. That's why we need to maintain uh, fuel temperatures below 55 degrees Celsius by cooling down the fuel through a fuel cooler before the fuel goes back to the fuel tank. Let's proceed with this. That's how the injector looks like. Here we have one seal, and here we have another seal. In between these two seals, we have the fuel flow going through the six injectors. In general, all electronic engines, injectors, use very high uh, fuel pressures. I'm talking about the fuel pressure inside the injector. Um, on this engine, the minimum 
fuel pressure that we need inside the injector to have a spraying is 5,000 PSI. This is how much you will get when you are cranking your engine. You know, when you crank the engine, the uh, crankshaft will be turning at around 200 RPMs when you crank the engine. So this is enough. This RPM, the 200, around 200 RPM is enough for the injector to, uh, you know, raise the fuel inside it to 5,000 PSI and fuel spraying would start. And then the engine would start, of course. 30,000 PSI is the maximum fuel pressure that we will get from the injectors. Whenever the engine is running at 60 Hertz full load, that's how much pressure we might get. Why do we use very high fuel pressures on all electronic engines? Comparing this injector to the injector on the 1103 engine, on the 1103 engine, the small engine, the 27 kVA side, 30 kVA side genset, the pressure is like 250, 250 bars, injector pressure. This is uh, close to 5,000 PSI. In here, we might see 30,000 PSI. The secret is the six openings at the tip of the injectors are very small. Why? In order to have, here we go, on, mecha on standard mechanical engines like the 1103 engine, the few droplets that will come out from the injector would be big droplets. Of course, this is an exaggerated, you know, figure. By the end of the uh, the burning process, you know, in the third stroke, we might have some leftovers. Why? We didn't have enough time to burn up the fuel droplets completely. On the other end, if you look at these little tiny droplets, this is the same droplet broken down into five or six or seven smaller droplets by the uh, electronic injector. So by the end of the burning process, we barely have any leftovers. That's why we call electronic engines uh, environment-friendly engines, because they do not smoke. What is the smoke in the first place? Unburned fuel, the leftovers. We are wasting money and we are polluting the environment. So that's, this is a big advantage for electronic engines. They are very efficient. Going back to the injector, again, why do we use very high pressures? Because again, the six openings at the tip of the injector are very small. So you need very high fuel pressures to let the fuel go through these little tiny openings. We must be aware that all electronic injectors are sensitive to contaminated fuel, whether there is water in the fuel or dirt in the fuel. If there is water, let me go back to the uh, this figure in here. The primary fuel filter is used as a water separator as well. There is a draining plug at the bottom part of the canister through which we should drain, you know, the water if there is water in the a canister before we start the engine. Talking about the filters now, the primary and the secondary fuel filters, they are very fine filters. Let's talk about these filters a little bit. They are of the Eco Plus type. Let me explain. I'm talking about the fuel filters and oil filters as well. These are the papers, the corrugated papers inside the, you know, the uh, filter elements. Here you see silicone bleeds to make these corrugations, you know, uh, tough and held strongly together. And at the same time, this nylon strip going around in a helical way, you know, around the uh, corrugations as well to make them tough. The upper cover and the bottom cover of the filter as well is made from plastic. In here, what they did, they made this plastic cover get molded with the uh, corrugated papers so, so that it will be tough and this will not come up and, you know, get damaged. These are very good uh, filters. This is the oil filter that will go inside the canister, the oil canister, oil filter canister. In here, as you see, we have uh, uh, four star, you know, knobs in here. 
inside the canister, there's a probe. So this will go inside the probe. And the probe as well has, you know, these uh, notches, the four notches. Let's call them notches, okay? And this is of the 35 micron type, the oil filter. The fuel filters, the primary and the secondary. This is a two microns filter. This is a 10 microns filter. Again, if you see in here, we have three notches. Here we have five. So inside their canisters, we have the probes at the bottom of the, of the canister. And this would not fit instead of this one on the primary you know, canister because the probes are, should be matching with the number of you know, uh, uh, these notches that we have on this uh, filter or the other one. What do we mean by micron, two microns or uh, 10 microns? These, corrugation, these corrugated papers, they have uh, pores through which the fuel will be going. The openings of these pores, the diameter of these probes, it, for this one, it's 10 microns. For this one, it's 2 microns. What is a micron? How big is a micron? A salt grain, you know, salt. One grain of salt has around 80 microns in diameter. It, is, it has a diameter of 80 microns, 8, 0. So just imagine how small is a micron. You need the microscope to see a, anything which has a one micron diameter. So these are very fine fuel filters. We highly recommend using genuine filters for the oil and for the fuel filters. We have seen many, many, many engine failures because uh, customers were using non-genuine filters. Believe me, it will cause a lot of damages to the engine. We have seen many, many engines having like the damaged injectors, damaged engine bearings, you know, pistons because of using non-genuine oil or fuel filters. Okay, here we go. This is the uh, radiator. This is the radiator. It is made from uh, aluminum. This is what we have at the moment. Most of the engines we have up to 1000 kVA size. The matrix is made from aluminum. Why? It is cheaper than copper and uh, it has higher thermal conductivity. Okay, talking about uh, valve and injectors adjustments. Let me first mention how the injector works. We mentioned that it is mechanically actuated type of engine, right? Let's go to the injector a little bit. Here we go. At the top of any piston, we have three rocker arms. Let's say this is for the inlet valves. This rocker arm is for the exhaust valves. And the big one in the middle is for the injector. So we are using a mechanical force, a rocker arm, to push down the plunger of the injector. And that's how it works. That's the mechanical force we are using to highly compress the fuel inside the injector. Let's look at the injector before we proceed, you know, with the adjustment of the injectors and the uh, uh, valves as well. Here we go. This is the injector. We have, as we mentioned before, we have two seals. Uh, we have one seal in here, and this is the other seal. In between these two seals, we have fuel. Let's see how the fuel goes in. There's one little tiny opening on in here through which fuel will go in. Fuel will go in, go around the plunger, go all the way up to this point. Here we have this puppet, which is controlled by the uh, electronic solenoid mounted on the injector. Whenever the solenoid is energized, the ECM will give it 110 volts DC. That's how, uh, how much is the voltage signal sent from the ECM to the solenoid. Okay, let's suppose that the plunger is not pushed down and the solenoid is not energized. So the fuel will go in. So uh, again, the fuel will go in. Again, the plunger is not pushed down. The solenoid is not energized. So the fuel will go in, go through this route, go in here, go through this passage all the way down to here, fill up this fuel chamber, 
below the plunger and go all the way down around the needle and the needle is spring loaded covering up the six tiny opening through which fuel should be sprayed now when the uh, rocker arm starts pushing down the plunger and at the same time the solenoid is energized what's going to happen here when the sound is energized a magnetic field will be created in here and the puppet will be pulled up when the puppet is pulled up it will block the passage of the fuel at this point which means the more the plunger goes down the higher the fuel pressure would be uh, in, would be increasing in here why because the fuel here is trapped it cannot escape going back to the same route it came in so this plunger will keep going down as long uh, and pressurizing the fuel in here as long as the solenoid is energized we need a minimum of 5000 psi fuel pressure uh, to lift up this spring loaded needle and have a fuel spraying so that's how the injector works on all MIUI engines. Let's go back to the uh, adjustments of the uh, valves and the injectors as well. Here we go. When we do the adjustments, we need to keep in mind that for the inlet valves, we should adjust the valve lashes to 0 0.40 millimeters, okay? Why is it 0 0.38 in here? Because this is an American engine. This is the proper number they go with, 0 0.015 inches, 0 0.030 inches for the exhaust valve. So, you know, in our countries, we use the millimeters. So in here, we use 0 0.40 millimeters. Here, we use 0 0.75 millimeters for the valve lashes. To adjust the injectors and the uh, valves, we need to make two engine turns to adjust everything uh one more thing to mention here <clears throat> looking at the engine itself this is the flywheel side okay and here we have this flange it is mounted with two bolts this one a short bolt and this one a long bolt we take out this this flange this is a special tool we call it a turning tool this should go in all the way in and it will engage with the teeth of the flywheel which we have in, inside here. Using a ratchet, we can, you know, start turning the engine the proper way, of course, okay? The proper rotation way. When I make, you know, the valve and injector adjustments. In here, there's a plug. We take off the plug using this long bolt that is here. Let it go in. And this is a one-man show in here. So uh, one man will be putting a ratchet in here and turning the engine and at the same time pushing this bolt with his finger on the flywheel side there is this locator it's like a little tiny hole so the bolt which is uh, pushed in through here will be touching the surface of the flywheel keep turning the engine till the bolt you feel that the bolt is going in a little bit you stop this is an indication that let me go back in here that pistons one and six are at top dead center of course let's say one might be on compression and six would be rocking who would tell which one is rocking and which one is uh, on compression ready for valve adjustments we need another person to be you know of course we need to take out the head cover the plastic head cover and another person should be watching the rocker arms of piston number one and piston number six okay whenever let's say he found that piston number six rocker arms are rocking and the uh this bolt the long one which is uh, inserted here has got into this little tiny hole the indicator it means that we are ready for valve adjustments one and six are at the top dead center one is on compression let's say this is the on compression for example and this is rocking so we proceed according to this table just to make you know things easier for you this is where the uh, turning tool should go in and this is where the bolt uh, should be going in touching the uh, you know the surface of the flywheel okay let's look at the table how we make the adjustment here we go 
So if piston number one is on compression, we adjust the inlet valves of three pistons, half the engine. The uh, inlet valves of pistons one, two, and four at the same time. Plus, we adjust the exhaust valves again of piston number one, piston number three, and piston number five. And three injectors at the same time. Uh, injectors of pistons three, five, and six. I'll explain in a second how we adjust the injectors. When we finish adjusting half the inlet valves, half the exhaust valves, and half the injectors, we turn the engine again. Here we go. Okay, you turn the engine again and push the bolt again till the bolt goes in again. We have made one full turn, 360 degrees. Do we still need the second person who was, uh, you know, watching the rocker arms of one and six? No, not necessarily, because now we know whenever the bolts, which is inserted here, goes through this uh, hole, it means that one and six are at the top, but this time it is one rocking six ready on compression. So going back to the table, this time we adjust the inlet valves of pistons three, five, and six, the exhaust valves of pistons two, four, and six, plus at the same time injectors of pistons one, two and four. This way we have adjusted all the inlet valves, all the exhaust valves and all the injectors in only two engine turns. We can use this process for any six cylinder engine, not necessarily MIUI engines, any engine. Of course, we don't have the indicator or the turning tool for the other engines, like the 1106 engine or the, um, you know, the 1506 engine adjusting the, injector, the valves on the 1506, no injectors because it's a hydraulic engine, HEWI. Anyway, uh, again, the valve lashes for the inlet valves is 0 0.40, for the exhaust valves it is 0 0.75, okay? How do we adjust the injectors? There are two ways to do it, two options to do it. If you have this special tool, this is a special tool, it should go around, you know, the uh, this part of the injector, and if you look in here closely, there is a machine shoulder. See, it's like a seat. This tip of the special tool should be touching the seat. And in here, if you look in here, uh, at the top, on the other end of the uh, this uh, pin, you see that we have a high surface and a low surface. The low surface must be matching with the upper surface of the special tool, okay? If it is not set properly, you need to make adjustments by this bolt, okay? At the tip of the rocker arm, which is, you know, compressing the plunger of the injector. The other way, which is easier, this is what we use. There is no need for a special tool. That's what we do, guys. You need a vernier, you know, a vernier. It is available in all the markets. That's what you do. Look in here closely. Again, the probe of the vernier should be touching the seat that I have mentioned earlier on, on the injector. And the other, uh, the base of the vernier should be touching this surface on the injector. Okay, we should read 78 millimeters. If you don't read 78 millimeters, let's say I'm reading 75, it means that the injector is compressed down a little bit. You need to go on here and loosen the bolt, okay, counterclockwise till you read 78 millimeters. If you read, let's say on the vernier, let's say 80 millimeters, it means that you need to compress the plunger a little bit, go down by two millimeters to get the proper settings. So again, what you do in here with this bolt, you tighten the bolt all the way till you get a reading which is 78 millimeters. That's how we do it. It is very easy. Okay, talking a little bit about the ECM and its sensors. The ECM that we have on these 2500 series engines is 
of the atom four type. That's how it looks like. This is the atom four. It has a cooling fins. Okay. What do we mean by atom? If you like to know, advanced diesel electronic management. So this is atom four type. On the new engines that we started receiving, you know, we have the atom five. It looks different. Atom five type, like on the twelve oh six engine and the revised four thousand series engines, we have the atom five. And on the newly introduced engine, electronic engine as well, 1706, which covers two KVA sizes, 300 and 350 KVA size, the ECM is of the Adam 6 type. So again, on this 2500 series engine, the ECM that we have on the engine is the Adam 4 type. Here we go. For any ECM, what is the job of the ECM in general? Any ECM to control, monitor, and protect the engine. That's the main jobs of the ECM. For the ECM to uh, do all these three things, you know, controlling the engine, monitoring the engine, protecting the engine, it needs data. So uh, the data to be uh, you know, supplied to the ECM, it has to be done through ECM sensors. We have three types of sensors. This applies to all electronic engines. What I'm explaining applies to all electronic engines. Um, we have uh, three types. Let's talk about the first type. Here we go. These are pressure reading sensors. By the way, on this engine, we have the total number of eight ECM sensors. Okay? So we have pressure reading sensors, temperature reading sensors, and speed reading sensors so let's talk about the first one that's how it looks like it has three wires connected to it that's how we distinguish between uh, sensors whether they are pressure reading sensors or temperature reading sensors on the pressure reading sensors we have three wires connected to the sensor the temperature reading sensors only two wires are connected to the sensors that's how we can distinguish between you know both types going back to the pressure reading sensors we have three pressure reading sensors on this engine this one reading the atmospheric pressure this one the reading the uh, let's call it boost pressure air boost the pressure and this one which is reading the engine oil pressure this one if it gets faulty i'm talking about the sensor your engine will shut down in here if any of these gets faulty you will only have a warning on the ecm no shutdowns three wires are connected this is a signal wire through which a 5 volt DC signal is sent from the ECM to the sensor. And we have a ground wire. And we have this wire as well through which a returning signal will go back to the ECM. The returning signal should be in between 0 0.5 and 4.5 volts DC. If the returning signal is less than 0.5 or more than 4.5, a, a warning or shutdown will be generated or on the ECM side, saying your, your sensor is shorted high or low. The uh, temperature reading sensors, we have three as well. This is engine coolant temperature sensor, fuel temperature sensor, and inlet air temperature sensor. Two wires, again, the signal, five volts DC, the returning signal, the retaining signal should be between 0.5 and 4.5 volts DC as well. Okay. If this sensor gets faulty, your engine will shut down. Okay. If this one gets faulty, you will only have a warning. Remember why we need this sensor. If the fuel temperature exceeds 55 degrees Celsius, the ECM will give a warning saying high fuel temperature. Uh, why do we need the inlet air temperature sensor or going back in here, the inlet manifold pressure, air pressure sensor or the atmospheric pressure sensor? You know, these engines are smart. These sensors, let's suppose the engine is mounted at very high elevations, 2,000 meters above sea level. The higher you go, the less oxygen that you will have. So based on the readings from these two sensors, the ECM can calculate how much oxygen is going inside the engine. So based on this information, it knows how much fuel should be sprayed. 
and your engine will not, uh, you know, give uh, uh, black exhaust smoke because the air to fuel ratio will be uh, uh, proper, you know, the proper air to fuel ratio. Of course, it will not give you the same power. The engine will not give the same power. You don't, you don't have enough oxygen. If comparing this engine to a classical engine, 27 kVA size engine, the 27 kVA size engine at 2000 meters above sea level, it might give some exhaust black smoke because the injector is still spraying the same amount of fuel. Temperature sensors. This one, for example, why do we need this one? You know, uh, sometimes these engines are operating in very high ambient temperature uh, climates, like in the Arabian Gulf areas, where you have ambient temperatures in summertime like 50 degrees Celsius. The higher the temperatures, the less oxygen that you will have in the, in the air. Again, based on the reading from this sensor, the ECM can calculate how much oxygen is going inside the engine. And based on this information, it knows how much fuel should be sprayed to keep and maintain the proper air to fuel ratio so that your engine will not smoke. But of course, you will be getting less engine power. You don't have enough oxygen. Okay, the uh, speed sensors, they would tell the ECM how much is the speed of the engine, okay? Plus, if you still remember when we talked about the engine, we said it's a MIUI engine. Here we go. We said, concerning the engine timing, when should the injectors be spraying fuel? It is electronic controlled, the timing, by the ECM. Let's see how this is done. Here we go. The speed sensors would be facing these teeth. On the camshaft side, we have, you know, these teeth, 36. And you see the uh, distances between the, uh, the, uh, the teeth, it is uh, the same. But in here, they implanted an extra tooth. On the crankshaft side, we have 36 teeth as well. Here we go. The sensor will be facing these teeth, not these. In here, they took off one of these 36 teeth, and we have a big gap. Every time a tooth comes facing the tip of the sensor in here, a five volt AC signal will be generated and sent to back to the ECM. When the tooth goes, the gap comes, a zero vo a volt AC signal will go back to the ECM. These are digital type of speed sensors, PWM type pulse width modulation. So it's a square wave. Every time you have a five volt AC signal going back to the ECM, it will be a square wave like this, okay? It's five, zero, five, zero, and that's how it goes. Now, whenever the ECM reads this interrupting uh, five volt AC signal or long zero AC signal, this is a disrupting uh, signal. This is an indication for the ECM that piston number one is at top dead center, okay? For the camshaft, whenever this disrupted signal is read by the ECM, it means that piston number one is at top dead center compression stroke, which means it is ready for the fuel spraying. So the moment the ECM reads this disrupting signal, it knows that piston number one is ready and the ECM will send 110 volts DC uh, signal to the solenoid of piston number one injector. As for the uh, other five injectors, because this would be giving a reading only when piston number one is ready. How about the other five pistons? By calculation, the ECM can tell the location of the other pistons based on this reference reading of piston number one. So that's how it goes. What I'm mentioning here, this method, applies to all electronic engines. That's how it works for all electronic engines. So again, these uh, sensors are called speed position sensors, okay? Let's see if there is anything else to mention here. Okay, on the uh, solenoids of uh, electronic injectors, it might be on the solenoid itself or on the upper part of the injector we have the uh, numbers like this we call them injector e trim code okay every injector 
manufactured by Caterpillar. The clearances inside are would not be the same if you compare one injector to any other injector. It would not be the same. So, based on this reading, on this number in here, this is the number, this is the name of a flash file, okay? They call it injector e trim flash file. It should, this number should be programmed to the ECM. Each injector has a different, you know, code. Based on these numbers that are programmed to the ECM, the ECM would would know how much are the clearances inside the uh, injector. Based on these readings that it's getting from the ETHRIM code the flash file, it will be uh, supplying different amounts of fuel to the injectors. Every injector will be having a different amount of uh, inlet fuel going in. Why? So that whenever we have fuel spraying, the amount of fuel sprayed by all six injectors would be exactly the same. This is for better engine performing efficiency. So all injectors will be spraying the same amount of fuel, but the input of fuel to all six injectors would not be the same. The output is the same, but the input is not the same. How would the ECM tell? Based on the code here, the flash file name here, which is programmed on the ECM for each one of these six injectors. To communicate with the ECM, we need a software. The software is called EST, Electronic Service Tool. This software, uh, it's not for free. Every year we pay money for the license of this software, Electronic Service Tool, that's the software. We need two things to get connected to the ECM. We need the software, which would be, you know, uh, a license type where we pay a fee every year. And we need the connecting tool. The connecting tool must be uh, this up-to-date type, which is called CA3, Communication Adapter 3. If you have the compact type uh, of the, we have another, you know, uh, kind of connecting tool. We call it Compact Communication Adapter. You cannot use it anymore with the Adam 5 ECMs or the Adam 6 ECMs. You must have the CA3 type to communicate with the Adam 5 and the Adam 6. With the compact communication adapter, you can only communicate with the Adam 4, but not the 5, not the 6. So take this into consideration. I think uh, basically that's it. We're not going to go through the, uh, the software itself. This would be a different, you know, lecture. So uh, this is the lecture for today. And if you have any questions, please let me know the questions to answer it for you. We have two sets, one 2200 series and the other one is 2500 series. It is 50 Hertz, 50 Hertz. Now we need 60 Hertz and yes, of course, as I mentioned before, all what you need to do for the 2200 series and the 2500 series, all what you need to do is make a link between wires 318 and 322, 318 and 322, okay? And the speed of the engine should go to 60 hertz. Remember, you need to adjust the settings on the control panel and the AVR as well, okay? Uh, by the way, uh, we used to receive, you know, uh, engines with ECMs having flash files for 50 hertz only. But all the ones that we are receiving at the moment, the flash file is switchable, 50, 60 hertz. So whenever you make the link, the speed will go to 1800 RPM. Okay? Other questions? Tag one and tag two can be used as replacement of both capacity. Ah, uh, I didn't get your question exactly what you mean by this. As I mentioned, uh, let me try to answer the question as I understood the question. The only difference between the uh, tag one and the tag two is the software on the ECM. And we can, uh, you know, uh, upgrade uh, the uh, software on the tag one to make it tag two and vice versa. But this has to be done through Perkins. You know, we need to uh, 
download for example let's say we are trying to upgrade a tag one to tag two what we need to do is download a tag two flash file to to this ecm which is of the tag one uh, one software the ecm will be will be blocked and it will ask for factor passwords so we go online perkins you know uh, website online and fill up an online form and send it to perkins and they will send us factory passwords that we need to put in and the ecm software will convert from tag one to tag two and vice versa if this is what you mean by your question okay other questions no 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 this engine is made in usa Peoria, illinois usa even the ecm it is made by cat the whole engine is made by cat in usa not in uk not in china other questions where are the ecu and avr on the neutrons located sir okay the ecu is mounted on the side of the engine block okay um if i'm looking from the control panel side it would be on the left side of the engine okay on the engine block the avr in general all the avrs are mounted inside the alternator itself you open up the hood of the alternator and you will see the uh, avr inside regardless of the size okay other questions since the secondary canister has two microns it absorbs all the small debris coming from with the fuel is it enough to use one canister for filtration system with the small micro spaces uh that's a good question uh the answer is no because if you use only one filter with you know small microns two microns for example it will easily get clogged by dirt and it will not last for 250 running hours we had this kind of you know uh uh testing you know uh and experience you know on field we must have two filters one with a 10 micron or whatever and the other one two microns otherwise the two micron if it only used by itself only one it will easily get clogged and cannot you know uh, go to 250 running hours no way you must have two a 10 micron two micron or 15 micron two micron whatever but you must have two and I, another question can you clarify the reason behind a black smoke coming out from the exhaust black smoke means extra fuel spray it might be defective injectors spraying too much fuel or it might be the lack of enough oxygen to keep the air to fuel ratio for example if you see the air filter clogged you will see black smoke why not enough air going inside the engine the injector is spraying the normal amount of fuel but the air is not enough so in this case it is too much fuel compared to the air uh, ratio so you will have a black smoke on big engines where we have air coolers if you have leakages from the air cooling system you know the air radiator from the hoses you this means not enough air going inside the engine to the combustion chambers and you will see black smoke as well not enough oxygen compared to the sprayed fuel amount okay other questions Crank position sensor can cause long cranking if long distance crank pinion gear. Oh, I didn't get your question. Crank position sensor can cause long cranking if long distance crank pinion gear. Oh, I didn't get your question. But I don't I don't see any uh, issues, you know, with these engines. They can, you know, remember we have two sensors on this engine. When speed sensors one on the crankshaft side one on the camshaft side so if one is not working properly the other one will do the job we didn't see any issues with this how how voltage of the fuel injector sonar become 110 volts since the genset volt is 12 yes that's a good question on let me give you an example here to simplify things on cars let's talk about the uh, old type of uh, cars you know the battery is 12 volts do you know how much is the voltage going to the spark plugs it might at at idling speeds it might be 5000 volt dc when you speed up it might go up to around 20 or 25000 volts dc how is this is happening uh they use 
what we call an inductance circuit, okay? Inductance circuit. It will magnify the voltage from low numbers to high numbers. It is the same issue, but this inductance circuit is mounted inside the ECM to magnify the voltage from 24 to 110 volts DC. Another question. When changing frequency, is the power will change as mechanical engines? In general, these engines, the 2500 series and the 2800 series, the bigger ones, whenever you switch from 50 to 60 hertz, you would still have the same kilowatt output power. It will not give you more power for these engines, okay? They call these engines iron engines. That's what they call them, okay? Perkins, that's what they call them. They will not give you extra power. What is normal oil pressure in the engine in this series? It is just like any other engine, four to five bars. That's how much. It might go, you know, it'll be down to three bars whenever the, uh, the oil gets hot, whenever you are running your engine. But in general, it is four to five bars, okay? We notice a lot of cylinder head cracks in this series. Any upgraded for it? Uh, we didn't really see that many, you know, cracks on these heads. We would have cracks on heads whenever your engine is overheating. You might have an overheating issues. This one might cause cracks on the heads. But in general, no, it's a good engine. The heads are fine and heavy duty. Make sure that you don't have overheating. This would cause damage. Okay, let's see this one. For any questions, okay, sir, those are not splashing diesel as it's required, yeah. Could the ESM cause it? Uh, no, I would say the, the, this would be due to contaminated fuel, okay? We see this a lot, contaminated fuel. It might be dirt or water getting to injectors in general, okay? We have 500 kV genset, display alarm FMI 13. How we can resolve the issue? We need to know what is the FMI 13. Go to Google, or if you have the, the manuals for the engine, it will tell you what this uh, FMI 13, you know, stands for. Or if you have the EST, okay, get connected to the ECM, and it will tell you what is the fault. Otherwise, go to Google, okay, and you will find what uh, this FMI code, FMI 13 stands for, to resolve the issue. Okay, sometimes we face the failure of some parts. So where can we get the parts catalog for easier order of the parts using part numbers? Usually Perkins does not supply the part uh, book for free. It is for money. You pay money, you get the part, parts book. That's how it goes with Perkins. Unless you get in touch with, you know, any of our sister companies branches and we'll be more than happy to help you give you a part number for the specific part that you need. Okay, let's see this one. How can we stabilize hunting through ECM? If it's an add on for ECM, I'm talking about this engine, 2500 series, you go to the, uh, you need to get connected to the uh, ECM through EST. You go to uh, configuration tool all the way down to settings and you adjust the gain. Let's suppose the gain number is uh, 10,000. You need to do this as a trial and error. Engine is hunting, you start decreasing the number uh, by 250, let's say. Let's say it's 10,000, you make it 9,750, I'm talking about the gain. If hunting is still there, go down again to 9,500, to 9,250, 9,000, and so on. But do not go below 7,000, okay? This is the minimum, we cannot go below it. But first, check the fuel system. If there is air in the fuel system, it might cause hunting. This is the first thing that I would check. Okay, any other questions? How to calibrate crank and cam sensor? We don't. Why should we calibrate them? No need. Okay. IDMT protection means, I don't know. I don't know what IDMT stands for. G1 and G2 are governing performance classes possible for you to explain if G1, G2, G3, etc. I think the engines we have at the moment are of the G2 G2 or G3. Um, I need to go and check the engine technical data sheet 
Okay, I think either G2 or G3. Okay. Okay, if that's all for today, the questions. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks for, you know, attending this training and uh, hope to see you again in other, you know, trainings. Thank you all.